Hello everybody and today we are talking about Belisarius Call, The Great Work by Guy Haley. A fantastic book. Firstly, I'll say I love this book. It's called A Heretic. Yeah, tenfold. Our primary is still a stupid idea. Yeah, pretty much. But this book does go a long way, in my opinion, of making sense of the universe and call and the setting in general and offers uh, intriguing clues as to where 40k is going. That is, Guy Haley actually has been uh, told and hasn't made the mistake of trying to make sense of it before the main law team decide to do something else, ruining his efforts. We shall see. But yes, for long-time viewers, my gradual despair at some of the stuff that has occurred, such as the Indomitus Crusade ending before we knew anything, <laughs> the odd choice to allow Haley to end it in the Plague War, so that any new game stuff they bring out, like Vigilus and stuff, is kind of robbed of significance, other than that this fight happened here, because we, we know that nothing that dire happens, or for instance, no Primarchs return, because we know Gilliman would have mentioned it, probably. Uh, this book really does restore some order to me in terms of timeline and what's going on. Primaris are here to stay, lads, unfortunately, and acceptance of that fact is the only way. But never forget. But I will still weep tears of blood when Seth gets Primaris, which is uh, a word I never thought I would use two years ago. So let's give you an outline of the plot uh, with uh, as few tangents as I can manage. We have the main plot. The story is split between the Sives of the Emperor and Call and Company, going their separate ways and experiencing flashbacks within the Ferris. The Sives are a major part of the book, but it is primarily about Call and his background. At least, that's the best stuff. So we'll run through the story, and then I'll delve into the characters and other interesting things that come from the flashbacks towards the end. So, the book has a number of flashbacks, mostly uh, Call, but also the size of the Emperor, Chapter Master uh, the Theseus, and the Tetrarch Felix, uh, the Primaris dude, which we've now followed in three novels, and is Haley's kind of creation. Uh, just to say, if you want to understand the Dark Imperium setting and this new era of 40k, you really do need to read Dark Imperium and Plague War to really get a grasp on this novel and its place in the wider universe and what's going on. Again, this is massive spoilers. So turn it off if you haven't read any of this. But yeah, other than the flashbacks, it takes place on Sotha, or specifically within the Pharos complex itself. Now the Pharos is on Sotha. Now for avid Horus Heresy readers, and yes, I have read up to this point before I got distracted with life and keeping up with the uh, newer 40k books about two or three years ago. Well, you guys know Sotha. That was uh, the, the site of the Pharos and major events in the heresy. It is a vast communication and uh, transportation device of Necron origin, which I believe is confirmed here, which was never confirmed in the other stuff. Without getting massively into that part of the story, which is enormous, and I really like talking about Dantioch, I'll just say that this part of the heresy ends with the Pharos blasting out a massive amount of energy that blows away the Ruin Storm, which is cutting off Ultramar and all its uh, armies from Terra, allowing Gilliman to show up late and basically take over the Imperium, being the leader of the most powerful legion remaining after the heresy and uh, during the Great Scaring. It's nice that Guy Haley is able to pull together all these different strands of lore and make everything reasonably well connected, which is the kind of stuff I love to see. So this Ferris event is also the moment, however, that the Tyranids over in a neighbouring galaxy realise that there is life in ours and begin to move like a vast, horrible, life-consuming swarm across the emptiness of the in-between towards our universe, initiating the current situation with the Eastern Fringe being devoured slowly in the Tyrannic Wars when the first tendrils of the High Fleets begin to arrive, and also begin like a giant pair of snaky jaws to consume the entire universe from above and below, which is what's happening now, <clears throat> which has led to them showing up around the Eye of Terror region, and also 
for instance, the uh, Devastation of Baal. The Sides of the Emperor, uh, no, I've never really read the stuff about that chapter. It's older battle, uh, Space Marine battle novels and stuff. I've never read them, but I do remember the Sides of the Emperor. They've been around for a long time. I remember specifically there was a battle report years and years and years ago when I was younger uh, in Epic 40,000. It was like a whole campaign of the Sides of the Emperor versus the Tyranids. And I think it ends in a battle called the Devil's Coffin. I'm not too sure. I haven't looked it up. This is just me going off memory. Uh, basically, and I mean basically, and trust me, this may seem long, but it's comparatively not. Just trust me on this. To sum up what happened, they were a chapter of the Ultramarines left to defend this world and the surrounding ones as part of the 500 worlds of Ultramar. So as the chapters were split up, the sides of the Emperor were one of these these companies of the Ultramarines Legion that was turned into the the size of the Emperor, and uh, left to Garrison Sofa and the Pharos and all the other stuff. Over time, they forgot what the Pharos was and turned it into their fortress monastery and forgot all the history. They've just got like half-remembered myths, that sort of thing, which is pretty understandable after 10,000 years. And they did manage to create one of the more pleasant Imperial worlds to live on. However, as they were the spot the hive mind saw 10 millennia ago, it's not really surprising that this is the direction that the, the Hive Mind was heading. So when the fi Hive Fleet finally made it to Sofa and the Sives were lost, they were they lost their homeworld, they, it was consumed by the Tyranids. Uh, they were also the victim of sabotage because these filthy hybrids and xeno-corrupted serfs had emerged because the planet had been the victim of a gene stealer infestation. They didn't know, however, and this has been going on for centuries. The population was corrupted very, very slowly. The Tyranids were very careful about it, and they appear to have been a uh, a mutant, stra well, a strain of gene stealers, which were very psychically attuned, perfect for infiltrating this Astartes planet and the fortress monastery itself. Uh, so they weren't detectable by the Librarius or any of the other defenses that a chapter would normally have. All very fun and dark. I like the story. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Gene Stiller cult survived to a certain degree and managed to go with the Sibes as they fled the planet and spread again. And it ended in a confrontation between the, uh, the leader of these hybrids and stuff. And the family survived again, as, as Gene Stiller cults do. You've got to annihilate them completely, and that's very difficult. But the problem was this family had infiltrated the fleet, so they were able to begin to rebuild themselves. And that ended with the uh, the Sives getting smashed again and turned on again by all these corrupted serfs who begin... When the Primaris are on their way to reinforce them, uh, these, these new Sives of the Emperor, Primaris dudes, are on the way. The family panics a bit and decides that they've got to... They've got to do something and they start, like, damaging the fleet, trying to wipe out the actual original Sives that are left, the Space Marines that are left. It's a whole other thing. It's a whole other strand of the law... And I'm not, like, 100% on all of it. I remember reading the one book, uh, Diadolus, uh, the audio book on that, but that's as far as I went with this. So i just got to assume that Guy's done a, a good job of finishing this story arc and these characters and brought it to completion. Throne, bless you, Guy. You are a true master of fixing, sense-making, and uh, law recovery. Now, that was a super brief version, so onwards with the plot. So, Sofa is a nid-devoured world. The atmosphere and seas have all been eaten up. They're all gone. For some reason, and I hear that people are annoyed by plot holes to do with this book, the main space station wasn't devoured fully. And uh, Call has dispatched Quo, uh, Cove, Quove? I can't say it out loud. <laughs> the clone of Friedish to rebuild it and make it habitable with the permission of the Sives, who are really happy with the Primaris reinforcements, as it means their chapter is going to continue without the shame of the infiltration of the uh, gene stealers to stain their minds and their honour. So they haven't told anyone what actually happened. They've kept it a secret, the original Space Marines. Uh, for that reason, the last remaining original Sives and the last old Space Marines, about 30 of them, have arrived to join Call's expedition to the Ferros and their old chapter monastery, which it was. And he has also agreed to potentially terraform the planet because he can just do that. <laughs> we'll get to Call later on, though. All right? Triarch Felix and his bodyguard have also arrived. 
Uh, his bodyguard is made up of Primaris Marines from all of the different chapters which fall under his region of command, as this follows on from Plague War, so this is even further in the future. In Plague War, Gilliman ordered the reinstitution of the old Triarchy, so basically the 500 Worlds is now split under the, the Tetrarchs, who now have overall command of all of those territories, and the military is within their province, I guess you would say. This means, of course, that even though the chapters are still separate, Gilliman still does have personal command of a legion's worth of troops, and is still the most powerful leader in the universe, rightly as Lord Commander of the Imperium, and with a personal hold of the Ultramar Sector, the 500 Worlds and the very personal loyalty of all of the forces within them, as they are all derived from his gene stock and view him as a father. Uh, plus everything else. Uh, you see why other organisations should be concerned? So, Call shows up in this Arc Mechanicum, which is massive and ridiculously advanced. Now, I would advise anyone to read the preceding short story to speak as one. I did review it, but to sum it up, the Inquisition think Call wants an Eldar prisoner they have, but he doesn't. It's actually a trick. Uh, Alpha Primus, who we'll talk about later on, breaks in because there is a Necron cryptech in a forgotten cell on this near-dead space station that they've just reoccupied. Uh, the station was only just brought back online. Uh, it had been left to rot, basically. The It's a good story uh, where Primus says being a servant of the Emperor ceased having all meaning to him centuries ago. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go through the individual characters at the end, though. It's a good story. It's worth picking up for more context on this novel, as well as showing the tensions and uh, conflict between the different wings of the Imperium, as we have an Inquisitor furious at Gaul, at uh, Call, at Gilliman, and the Inquisition uh, feeling like they need to be at the top of the, power, the, the pyramid of power, so to speak. So this is also the way... Haley explains how Call learns how to interface with, the, I guess, the computer mainframe of the Necrons, basically, but super advanced version. He basically interrogates this cryptech somehow, uh, breaking his mind, interrogating him, cutting him up, whatever he does, uh, probably some clever tech way. He seems to have the body still there, but uh, by by interfacing with this Necron who's in his own little separate sarcophagus, he uh, manages to learn how to, initially at least, break into the Necron systems. So you definitely need to read this, otherwise this whole book will seem like a bit odd and a bit of a surprise. And I'm surprised that it wasn't included in this novel, because it adds a lot of context, which I think might be lost on some people. So anyway, Call immediately starts heading for the planet, with Felix and the Sives heading to the planet behind him and they're infuriating, and they're infuriated with him because he's just gone and done this. Interesting note, Haley said, oh, he also makes this ridiculously dangerous warp entry, not outside the system at the Mandeville points, you know, in safety, away from any planets. Uh, he just warps in <laughs> directly next to the planet. Ah. <laughs> he's a tosser, it's great. They're on board a Overlord, and interesting thing, because I know a lot of people don't use Twitter and stuff, but I saw this, I saw Guy Haley talking about this, and he said that the idea of the Overlord, which is a ship that's bigger than a Thunderhawk and is able to like transport basically like a, a company or a demi-company. It's like a super Thunderhawk, like five, six times bigger than a Thunderhawk. So it can transport tanks, it's got living quarters, you know, cafeteria, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's just something he came up with. It's not like an official thing, but clearly it has become official now. So it's something that we're going to see in the future. And uh, yeah... I saw this on, on Twitter. He was just saying this. <laughs> so there we go. That's the Overlord for you. If you've read it in the other books, yeah, that's that's what it is. It's it's going to be canon now, though, blatantly. Uh, so they meet up with Call, and Felix isn't happy. And Call is his usual self, which I have to say has grown on me. Uh, Haley has succeeded in fleshing out this character in this book, and I have to say I do like him. He is a Mary Sue. He is. Kind of, but with some reasoning to get away with not being obnoxious, in my view. It is an obnoxious, which I think is the main thing with, like, you know, Mary Sue's or Mary Stew's or, uh, you know, Deus Ex Mechanica and all that. I, I, I don't dislike Call at all. <laughs> it seems pretty reasonable, everything he does, to be fair, considering his background. But we'll get to all that later. So they head into the Ferros, and suspicions are raised about the Sives and how they fell. Now, for me... 
This feels like a, a B story, which in all honesty isn't crucial to the really good stuff. But if you're a fan of them and the, the previous books involving them, I think this is a reasonable conclusion to them, I think. Uh, for me, I have no investment, really. So I wasn't super fussed. But I respect the effort to bring together these different stories and characters into the new setting and bind them together and give this some kind of completion. So within the Pharos, time shifts begin to happen. For all of them, uh, the Scythes see things from the past of the Tyranid invasion and events from the Gene Steeler infestation. Now, their mission is apparently to lay their gene vaults to rest, as the Primaris gene seed is the future, so they want to remove their shame so the new boys aren't burdened with it. Uh, what they really want to do is find the Patriarch who started it all and began the infestation and slay it for the sake of honour. And it'll be like their last act, which they do do. Spoilers! Now, the truly important stuff is with Core, primarily, and Primus, and Felix. The reason the time shifts are happening is that Core knows how to wake up the Ferris's Necron systems because he has a, this kind of interface due to the events of the short story. The Pharos isn't a tomb world. It is a node on a galaxy-wide information system which allows the Necrons to travel and communicate and so on. An integral part of their old empire. But it is also a prison and is powered by, or controlled by at least, anchored by, the Shards of the Catan, which I believe, I believe power it to a degree, or at least anchor it. Cole wants to find these shards, or maybe he knows that there's only one shard left that's active. But either way, he is attempting to gain access to the Necron's knowledge that is either within the Catan or the Pharos or both. By activating the Pharos, time jumps occur, allowing people to relive moments from their past. Now, in my view, this is the Catan within it, attempting to learn about the universe by viewing what they view by forcing the explorers to relive these moments in their past. Uh, this is not a psychic happening, because the structure's made of black stone, and, you know, very much the, the Necrons and the Catan in particular, very much of the physical universe. They're masters of the physical universe. They are not warp entities. They are not attuned to the warp. That was the old ones. So it's purely physical. Also, it's kind of like a multidimensional prism, which allows, at moments, the, the viewer to see alternate realities. So we have this... I don't know, have any of you ever seen the Star Trek episode where the multiple different enterprises all appear in the same region? And it's considered by many the most depressing <laughs> as it shows all these horrible realities. Uh, but yeah, it's basically the idea for every choice you make, there is an alternative dimension where you didn't do that and life continues in a different direction. Or maybe the same, just subtly different because this one thing. Uh, alternatively, you don't exist because way back someone made a choice which changed the timeline of your reality. Uh, you know, every decision, every second splits off again and again and again into a new reality. Your reality is your timeline and it is unique. And every action results in a new and different reality, mirroring yours, but different like Sliders, that's a great show from Boomer Days, which, which covers this kind of thing. I hope I'm making sense to you. I hope you understand this concept. Most people do, so I'm just over-talking it. Anyway, so the Necron Tomb World uh, begins to wake up. Tomb Scarabs began to begin to wake up and follow their maintenance programs and repair and renew this Necron structure. Uh, they you know, removing the imperial stuff uh, that has been attached to it, you know, marble, statues, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we learn some awesome stuff from Call about tomb worlds and scarabs performing this function. He mentions that uh, on one world, it started to fall into a singularity or a black hole, and the scarabs tried to fight against this until they multiplied into such an extent that they became like a vast floating swarm of scarabs in space, a planet-sized version. Because uh, they consumed everything in order to have enough numbers to fight against this pull of this uh, this energy. It's good stuff. It's nice. Now I love all this. I love the high sci-fi stuff. I love I love this, and we don't get enough of it in 40k. Not all the time, but this is a real opportunity to throw in all these science fiction ideas, which I really like. Now the story splits off here. 
uh, with the Sive chapter master and his last remaining old marines. They go deep and confront their past. We get flashbacks covering their story of them figuring out how they were betrayed and infiltrated by gene stealers. Now, a lot of this is sort of this this whole saga is covered in these other Sives of the Emperor books. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it's kind of. I'm not invested in it. It's interesting to know because I'm aware of it, but um, it felt like a, a very much a B story. There are, you know, it's nice that it's in there and it's good that it's in there, but eh, I could do without it. <laughs> this book would have been great anyway, but it's nice that it's in there and it's nice that he's binding together these different stories. So they face the, pri- uh, the Patriarch, which somehow and for some reason wasn't consumed by the High Fleet, uh, but left there. The explanation, and I guess this is canon now, is, I guess, and, and it's not something I've heard before, but the Tyranids leave behind creatures so that they can attack or alert the attack the invaders or alert the hive mind of when life returns to this planet. I, I, that doesn't feel quite right. It feels off to me, and I don't like it, <laughs> as it ruins the... Uh, the they, it lessens the impact of the idea of the Tyranids consuming all organic matter on a planet. Because I've never heard this before, you know? This doesn't happen normally. You know, even the even the gene stealer cults that rise up when they're present on a world that's being consumed, they'll get eaten as well. <laughs> you know? It's, it's part of the fun of it. You know, this is, this is just matter. This is just food to the hive mind. To this, you know... Gestalt hive mind just consuming all organic matter so it can grow and consume more and continue onwards. It's the ultimate predator beast. But, well, not even predator beast. Maybe it's a grazer. Maybe that's how it perceives itself. But it's it's not too out there to change this. And obviously for this story, it's the only way to uh, bring completion and wrap up this side story. And I guess the sort of... Because uh, they're deep within the Ferros, which is Blackstone, I guess the... The, the idea is that they've they've been separated from the the psychic presence of the hive mind. The, the the connection has been broken because Blackstone is so powerful and like a null. It acts as a null uh, to psychic perceptions and all that sort of stuff. Uh, which I guess is, is fine. It makes sense. It makes sense in this situation to use it. I guess. So I'll allow it. It's neat and it's tidy and it finishes everything off. Anyway, it goes on to kill them all. And using the, it's like psychic hypnosis powers, which again, I don't know how that's working then, if the Blackstone, anyway, it doesn't matter. It uses it on the chapter master, uh, even, uh, he's a cheeky bastard, and the, the patriarch even places its head on the chapter master's bolter to be like, yeah, you can't even shoot me. <laughs> and the infuriated chapter master knows that he can't pull the trigger on the beast, but what he does do is fire into the Necron tech that's in the floor, which calls forth the Scarabs to repair it and to remove the threat, which it does. They surround and consume and destroy the Patriarch. And thus ends the saga of the Sives of the Emperor. Uh, The chapter goes on as a purely Primaris force, but is ignorant of their chapter's dishonour, and the Marines themselves are martyred, I guess, in this expedition into the Ferris on behalf of Belisarius Call. S- this felt okay. Well, at the, so- at the side of Felix as well, so it's even more honourable as uh, Gilliman's like, right-hand man. This felt okay, but I-, I can understand if fans of this were annoyed because it feels like a, a waste. And it does feel like a waste because the place is like blowed up. <laughs> but this novel, this novel isn't really about them. It's just a necessary part of the story to cover because this whole, the Ferros and the Sives and everything are, are covered by another author. And this guy didn't finish the book series he was writing, this story he was writing. And it needed to be finished. And now I guess they can push forward into this new era using the Ferros or Sofa and the chapter can be used and have a clean break with the past, I guess. And someone else can take that on because they're a reasonably well-known chapter and they have been around for years, you know, decades at this point. Uh, so Cole learns more about his abilities, and he learns how to control the Necron technology as he's going through the Ferros. And eventually, they reach the tomb of the Catan. A bunch of other stuff happens with the Scarabs and all that. It's not essential. We're going to carry on with the main main chunks of the story. There are eight sarcophaguses, but only one looks active. Uh, he enters a kind of sub-dimension where the Catan entity uh, known as uh, Zarulash, the Potentate, 
uh, there he interacts with him and the interactions are amazing the story that uh, the way they speak to each other is brilliant and the things that this Catan comes out with are fantastic he's actually the best part of the book to be fair these are some of the best bits uh, that and the stuff with the Emperor he examines Call. he tells him well he, he says like he wants to just like uh, cut him up like an insect <laughs> and just like find out how he works but he examines Call. he goes through his memories he tells him humanity is a creature of the old ones, but corrupted and removed from their plan. But the way he says it, it's, he goes, uh, oh, you're one of theirs. <laughs> uh, reading his mind, he learns about you know the universe as it currently stands. He's pretty uh, disturbed and disgusted that the Great Rift exists. Uh, he's a, it's a leak into the material universe of the warp, uh, which he is the master of as a god of the material. The Chaos Gods are just jumped up warp entities. Uh, he says the Emperor is a weapon, which is intriguing. It's awesome, and something that has been hinted at before, and I've talked about before, and could mean multiple things, depending on how you interpret this. But this review is not going to go and in delving into the origins of the Emperor and all that. That's too much. It's an amazing conversation, though, and honestly, my favourite moment of the book. But there are other parts with the Emperor, which is... Surprising, there is so much interaction between the big man and Call in this book, or at least other characters in the Emperor. Um, but we'll get to that. Call and the Catan make a deal. He will free him, uh, allowing him to unite with his other shards of his existence, and he wants to go on to punish the Necrons who betrayed him and the other Catan gods. And uh, he will serve. Call will serve him in return for the knowledge to close the warp rift. And what follows is them escaping the tomb and its defences and the constructs which are waking up. All the while, Call is using his knowledge to sneak in, you know, in the in the ether, in the in the the tech world, and into the Necron systems to unlock the knowledge that Katan has. And he's pretty disturbed by what he sees in there. You know, they've got like AIs knocking around, and obviously this is pretty disgusting to call even as someone who likes to innovate and stuff you know ai are disgusting they are the worst of the worst but there's only i think he even says there's only one thing worse than ai and that's xenos ai which is nice now the katan and the others he was imprisoned with were in the pharos to anchor it to reality i'm pretty sure so as the machine is one of many, as I mentioned, for transportation and communication as part of this vast relay network across the universe and the worlds that were once part or still are part of the uh, Necron Empire or the slumbering Necron Empire. And as they begin to wake up and remove the fleshy invaders they find, this becomes more apparent. And that's been going on in the wider law. There is a big conflict going on as Call has ordered the Mechanicum to take a possession of the various... Blackstone deposits they encounter, but now he has a map to all of them. Without any Catan, uh, it begins to collapse, with the result being a black hole, which would eventually expand and destroy a lot of stuff. Well, I'm thinking it's a black hole. He says it's a singularity, and that's what I assumed, but it, it, it could be something else, but something bad. The Catan realises what's going on, Call stealing his knowledge, and he's going to betray him, and he wants to kill Call. But Call tells him he is the only one keeping the Singularity from breaking out as he has complete control of the Ferros' systems at the moment. He offers a choice to the Catan uh, that he could kill, da uh, kill, kill him and stay there and die alongside him. Or he could jump through this lovely portal, which is a magic portal, of course, always with the magic portals, which leads to a delicious star somewhere in the galaxy for him to eat. Whether it means this galaxy or somewhere else in the universe, I don't know. He isn't happy about this but he accepts and swears vengeance which is nice i really like the character i hope he pops up again because i really enjoyed this over the top godly arrogance of this character and the way he speaks he speaks like oh no i am a god it's great and i want to see more of him so hopefully he's not gone too far the sun the, the portal he got sent through hasn't sent him too far away and he pops up again and i, I think that'd be a nice a nice entrance to more necron stuff which i think is going to be coming with the with this whole call thing and with that, uh, they zip away back to their ship and to the Ferros. Uh, and that's destroyed from orbit. Now, I don't know if I'm just misremembering something, but no mention is made of what happened to uh, Felix's marine bodyguard. I'm not sure if he gave an order for them to withdraw. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But none of the brothers, uh, no one bothers to find out where the uh, sides went. That's just, yeah, they're, they're done. <laughs> uh, because the site is atomized from orbit. 
And I mean, that's fine. It's a price worth paying to stop the Ferros blowing up and turning into a vast singularity. But like, it's, it's not it's not even mentioned, really. <laughs> we have Felix apparently knowing that the Scythes had been infiltrated by gene stealers. And that's why they were secretive. But it's never really said to, to him how or... He's never really told us how he knows this. He's just like he's just sort of worked it out or just guessed. Which I guess is fine. Also, a big chunk of uh, call ship split off and landed on the planet. And I, I don't know if he gets mentioned what happened to that, whether it just takes off or what. Did it leave before and rejo- I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> I might just be misremembering though. I don't know. Either way, these elements are crucial, which I, I normally would think they are because the stuff we get about calls past and the early Imperium, his plans and all the flashback stuff have made me pretty happy with this book. So I'm not annoyed by anything I would normally consider an issue. I'm, re- I'm really easily pleased, Black Library and writers. This is all you've got to do for me. Just make me happy. Uh, the end of this book has uh, Call uh, sticking to his word and beginning to terraform the planet of Sotha. Uh, Felix again is annoyed because Call has disappeared and departed. Uh, Call himself is armed with a map of the ancient Necron Empire and every deposit in the galaxy of Blackstone. And he's going to go and continue to do his great work, hence the title. See what they did there? Anyway, we're going to delve deeper into the individual characters. Felix, Primus, and of course, Core. And what we discover about them by viewing their pasts. Uh, These are elements which really, they really make the book, for me, despite any legitimate issues people may have, compared to the mess the law was in, they are actually trying to make sense of it recently in a number of different ways. Some of it's still a bit off. I'm not happy about how the Dark Angels are presented with their acceptance of the Primaris and stuff. That seems off to me. Uh, but I believe they have realised their error and they're working to improve it. Uh, this this book is part of that effort and it does do a really good job. It's not like amazing. It doesn't fill all the gaps, but it's a great start. And I fought Guy Haley's Dark Imperium and the Plague War, which was... Which was good as well, but not as good as Dark Imperium. It didn't have as many insights. But this one, as a third book of this kind of this area, uh, is really good, and I like it. And compared to what we were getting, it's great, and I want more. I legit didn't like Core before. I thought he was a ridiculous character, and now I do. Kinda, I, I, I kinda do like him a lot. <laughs> All right. So first, let's talk about Felix. Uh, we met Felix in the Dark Imperium, and then in Plague War. And he has risen through the ranks to become one of the Tetrarchs and one of those, one of the most powerful people in the universe and the most trusted lieutenant of Gilliman, or one of them. He has an intense dislike of Kor because unlike others, he remembers the process of transformation into a Primaris. He remembers the pain of it, of Kor speaking to him. And Kor remembers this as well. And it appears he took a shine to young Felix uh, and, to, you know, I don't know, see him as gifted, like his paternal instincts came out. Uh, Felix was born during the Great Scouring, it appears, or, you know, just at the end of the heresy. And uh, This is a section of the book I loved as it conveys the sort of power of the events of a young boy, a child, being taken from his family, voluntarily, I assume. And then, I mean, what's going to happen to him? He's going to be cut up and brainwashed and turned into this amazing abomination that is a space marine i think this part really shows that the process of him waking from cryo sleep to be operated on as a small boy and the effect on his family when call or well, well i guess calls agents i assume uh, take him when he was about to be transported to the ultramarines to become a space marine and but they take him instead and bring him into this secret primaris project instead So to explain, he wanted to join the Ultramarines, and he clearly was good enough quality to be put forward to join the Ultramarines chapter, to be tested. Uh, But he was taken before he could board the ship to join the Primaris project. His family didn't know this, though, and to them, he just disappears. And so in flashbacks, we have Felix speaking with his brother, explaining the effect that this had on his family. They grieved for him. The family broke apart. His, His his mother and his father broke apart. His father never smiled again. You know, this disappearance of their son, which they had sacrificed, given away for the good of humanity, allowed him to be taken by the Ultramarines. And he didn't even make it 
He just disappeared. And none of the officials knew or refused to tell them what had happened. It's really sad. But it's it's the relationship with Cole that is fascinating. The mark of hate and distrust it has left on Felix is brilliantly conveyed. But for Cole's part, though, he says, well, you're not afraid of me, are you? And it kind of inspires him to be better, to be stronger. Not to impress Cole as his creator, but to show that he's he's more than what Cole did to him. He's not his creature, he's not his pet. I like that. But an excellent part of the story. He is also Gilliman's man, and he talks to Cole about his requests to become Fabricator General. Cole says he didn't say that. And that the implication is that the thinking machine Cole Inferior that Gilliman is speaking to is like misfiring or just I don't know, something's gone wrong there or whatever. Like it's not called telling it to do that, it's doing it of its own accord. And it's a copy of Call and maybe something's you know, it's changed some somewhat. Now initially I thought brilliant, that's funny. But now I think, ah, oh, maybe he's just lying. And it's some kind of psychological trick to keep the Primark guessing um, or to keep him out of his way. It's interesting, either way. Either way, you, you can take it either way, which I like. Um, I, but knowing Call, it probably is completely intentional. <laughs> it's like part of controlling the Primark and keeping him out of his business by distracting him, making him think that he's after power. Whereas what he's really doing is, I don't know, who knows what, with the Necrons, who knows? Now, Alpha Primaris. Uh, again, you really do need to read the short story I mentioned earlier because that gives us a lot of the Primus's inner thinking. And without that, you might look at this character in a different way. He is bigger, stronger, and a, a super powerful psyker. But he's bigger and stronger than all the other Primus. He's like a, a step above. He was Call's first Primaris, but he was a failure, as Primus says. He is proof that Call is not infallible and was too ambitious with the Primaris to start with. Felix tells us that Gilliman calls him a Chimera and would not have allowed his creation if he was around at the time and had specifically ordered Call not to use the traitor Legion's gene seed in full production. Call appears to have stuck to the letter of that but not the spirit and Primus seems to be a Primaris with a gene code mixed from all of the different Primarchs. It's shocking, really, but Primus himself says he is a failure. He is in constant pain, and Call overreached himself with his creation. And after this, he apparently rolled back his ambitions for the Primaris into what they are now. I like this, and I like the character. They are They specifically say he isn't a Primarch, but he is more than a Primaris, something in between. Also, in the Hall of Mirrors, the reflection of Primus shows 20... Yes, that's right, 20 Space Marines in the same armour as him. That's awesome. And I'm looking forward to see what happens with him. He is loyal to Call utterly. But he is sarky and pretty dry, which is a good uh, contrast with Call's character. You feel for him. And based on the description, he's very much like a Frankenstein's monster. Uh, monster, sorry. I let my I let my native tongue come in there. Monster. With different bits spliced together. Not just genetically, but like his actual body appears to be different bits that have been stitched together. That's sad too. It's so sad. So let's talk Quo. And it's spelled Q-V-O. So I'm just going to go with the pronunciation that I heard uh, in the audiobook. Uh, the character is a clone of Friedish, uh, Call's friend from the Heresy, a fellow tech priest or, a, you know, a cogboy in training. Uh, they escaped following the events in the Wolfbane not Heresy novel, which I will not get into because I don't know. What we see in the flashbacks is the pair making it to the Forge world of Riser, which has been in the lore forever, and it's nice that they're using this stuff now. And they were taken prisoner and then escorted to Terra by a Sedane's right-hand woman, uh, Hermania. She sounds pretty hot in the book. <laughs> Anyways, he was Cole's best friend. And rather than let him die of his wounds, Cole preserves his head and has been cloning him ever since. By the end of this book, we have uh, Quo 88, which is sad as well. God damn it. As I'm going through this, I realise why I like it. 
it's good, it's awesome stuff. But it's also really hitting me in the feeling parts of my black heart. It's super sad, all of it. Like, everybody's got something sad about him. <laughs> uh, Cole sometimes calls him Friedish. My dear Friedish. Because he's, he's his bro, man. And he's been cloning him. But the clone is not an exact copy. And, uh, you know, they keep saying, no, I'm, I'm Quo 87. I'm not Friedish. And Cole's just like, I know. I know. So sad. <laughs> they were bros, man. Now... To the main event, Core. And more importantly, we'll also decide whether he is a Mary Stew or a, a Deus Ex Machina. Well, you know, probably he is. But we will get to that after we cover the awesomeness and the stuff with the Emperor, which kind of makes me go, ah, I, I don't really care <laughs> if he is or not. Just give me more. Now, when Core was first introduced, I was like, what? And I, I've had a lot of fun. An annoyance with the introduction of the Primaris and this character, and the universe in general, what they've done to it. This book is the first time, for me though, where he really shines. As many viewers know, I'm behind on the heresy, because I've been reading all this other stuff, and I have a job, and a mediocre social life, and a somewhat successful love life. So, heresy has taken a back seat for me, and I've been reading the other stuff. But I'm, I'm still trying to catch up. I am going to catch up soon. That's to say I uh, I haven't read Wolfsbane. But I get the gist. And people tell me good things. And you can't be into Warhammer on the internet without people giving you spoilers all the time. It's just something you, you learn to live with. Anyway, Kor was loyal in the heresy and worked for uh, a master of soul merging. A science which isn't exactly lost, but it... It isn't as good as it was, and Cole seems to be the only one these days uh, to do it with any real effect, to do it properly. As the Catan says to him, you are an amalgam of different souls, uh, not just the one, and that's why he kind of trusts him a bit, because he sees himself in that. Or at least he agrees to the deal, because he, he's, he himself is just a shard of his true self, of his true being. It's also interesting this science appears to have been rediscovered by the Tau, uh, Earthcast, and they use it during the Dalith campaign, and it immediately made me think of that, uh, during the Democles Gulf Crusade. It works in a similar way, but not completely. The warriors who receive this treatment, they become locked in a certain way of thinking, or they get turned into potatoes, unable to think anymore, other than the way of a kind of the frozen mind of Commander Puritide. They only tried it out once and it didn't work. And a lot of, a lot of Tau died because of it. But uh, I guess it was for the greater good. You've got to try these things out, right? <laughs> it's a nice it's a nice story. You should definitely check out Blades of Democles. It's a, an underappreciated book. And it's nice to know that they're discussing these ideas clearly about, between themselves and you know firing off these different sci-fi ideas and taking them where they can go. And I like that. It's nice to know what they're talking about amongst themselves, the authors. Now... Call's inclusion at this point in the heresy uh, does show that at some point they had a pretty good idea or a sort of a plan for what they were going to do with the Dark Imperium because they've stuck him in here. And it appears that they wanted to link that with the new Dark Imperium stuff. And this is how they were going to go about it. Not just with Gilliman, but in, in this way as well. I think something's gone wrong somewhere. And a lot of the law became a bit of a mess and out of sync with each other. And I'm not sure why. So... Yeah, this, but this book has gone a long way to uh, assuaging my uh, my annoyance. Now, Call and Friedish are interrogated on Riser as possible heretics. And we get some nice stuff with him talking to the tech priests. It's all very nice cogboy stuff. It's good. And the man Haley shows the burned out horrors of the post-siege soul system so well. They, they see what has happened to Mars and they see the husk of terror. And it's only a short moment, but it really captures it. And again, it's sad. <laughs> it's here that Cole meets Ezekiel Sedain. Now, this chap is brilliant. A fantastic character. Now, the flashbacks, they all kind of jump about a bit. So, so I'm just trying to make sense of it as best I can and explain it to you guys. So, Sedain has got to be about 600 years old by this point in the book. At the end of the heresy. And the book starts out with him, the book itself starts out with him in bed. He's on his last legs. He's done. He's, he's dying. 
Then he is injected with a substance, an elixir, which immediately and painfully repairs the body and again restores youth to it. Now, this is grim, dark amazingness. So where does this substance come from? And why don't they have it in the future? Oh, well, dear viewer, it comes from the ground-down essences of a race called the Ardanians, who were a Xenos race which were deemed harmless and uh, allowed to become an imperial protectorate. But they were harvested to extinction, <laughs> as their bodies have like a, a, re a really powerful chemistry, which when mixed with humanity, acts as a rejuvenant that wipes away centuries of age on a genetic level, uh, probably similar to like consuming a soul. Their life essence actually repairs the frayed genetic strands that cause aging, and this is legit. It's nice that he kind of used a little bit of normal, real science to justify this. I like that. So this is, uh, if you look it up, if you look how people actually age and how you die and stuff like that, it's, it's interesting to see what happens. You know, your, your cells just break down and it doesn't need to happen. And I think they're going to figure it out at some point, but I doubt the treatment will be available to the likes of you and me. But uh, that's something else. It's worth looking into. It's funny. It's entertaining. Not funny. It's just weird. <laughs> I don't know. It's worth looking up. Uh, we find out that Ezekiel uh, has a, been around for, since before the Unification Wars, a fair measure before. Uh, but he was hungry for knowledge, having heard the tales of the old human star empire. And he went out to seek the emperor, and he found him in the Himalayas. He wanted to make the world a better place. He wanted to save humanity from the, the horrors of the Dark Age terror. You know, warlords, mass death, destruction, uh, you know, rot, decay. Uh, yeah, you, you know what happened then. The Emperor is acting as a lord, he's the lord of the lions. He was acting as a local power. Uh, still hiding in secret, but basically he was purifying the genes of the people living around. And I assume, it's quite clever because it's not explained, but you can you can pull a lot from that. So in my mind, he's for the good of humanity in general, but also to ensure that when he started making Thunder Warriors and then Space Marines, there was sufficient a sufficiently genetically pure population nearby that he could draw upon for his experimentations and just in general for the good of humanity. This is pretty awesome law uh, to have as we, we're already, he's already preparing for his great plan this far back and we get a glimpse of that. He's also got tunnels going underneath the terror all over the place. You know, this is the start. So he was also held in these fertility festivals. This is where he would do this, where I guess couples would come to be tested to make sure that their genetics are good or whether a pairing between a couple would uh, should occur or simply removing mutations to ensure the next generation was, you know, the standard he wanted. I like that. This is excellent stuff and it's fantastic to have it in here. Uh, now we get a lot of uh, Sedane in flashbacks and how the author uses flashbacks is to show how Cool's mind is broken and missing sections, as he's been mind wiped in the past, his mind's been merged and with others, and he's simply forgotten due to old age. And due to the old age, because he's got so much knowledge in his in his mind, it's necessitated removing parts of his memory and saving them and putting them into storage. So he has forgotten a lot. But by by tampering with the Ferros, he's able to manipulate time and see lost moments from his or his shared past. And this is what happens to the others on this on this journey. They see their past and alternative realities. Now, Sedane would become the greatest scientist of his age and would be alongside the Emperor as a scientist. Uh, this is funny, as that is a dirty word in the current universe, as the Mechanicum, and by extension humanity, is appalled by innovation and scientists uh, because of the Dark Age of Technology, of course. Now, Call even says that people are paranoid about him and they call him a scientist in the same way that they would call someone a heretic, which is nice. Sedane is given knowledge by the Emperor and works for him on his projects. He worked on the Astartes project that we know for sure, but maybe on other ones, maybe the Thunder Warriors, and presumably the Primark project. He became the director of the biotechnical division and replaced the original director, who the Astartes are named after. She was called Amar Astarte, but she couldn't she fell out of favour because she couldn't uh, get the black carapace to work, which is an essential part of uh, an Astartes. 
It's a, a complex part of space marine physiology. I'm not going to go into it here, but if you haven't looked it up, go and look it up. All the stuff's available like online. Now, let me know in the comments if you've read this book. But there is a part when he's looking at an ancient relic, a device, trying to figure out what it is. And I don't know if I'm missing something, but I think it's a CD player. You're going to let me know because it's frustrating, the description, and I'm not sure. And if it is a CD player, why is he so, like, discombobulated by it? Like, he must be able to work it out. I don't know if I'm just missing something and something else obvious that I've just gone mental. Uh, let me know. We have been meeting with the Emperor on a bridge over the Himalayas, speaking with the Emperor a number of times. And there's this, this awesome part that links it together with going bang, bang, bang. With him watching in the distance a car bonnet from, from our time which, I, well, presumably, something like that. It's from a car, uh, which has somehow made it up there through the ages, carried by rivers of the wind, and become stuck between two rocks banging in the breeze. Again, it's proper melancholy and sad. <laughs> so he's dying, but he's aware of this soul-merging technology or technique, which allows someone to live on. Uh, now... Whether this is actually their soul or just altering the brain of the other person, grafting on the other person's like brain, I don't know, something like that. It's 40k, it could be magic, who knows. I'm not sure, but it's it's probably a bit of both, it's 40k. This is why he wants call, because he has the right to augmetics as he has been trained by the creator of this technology, and he was given these things. Now, the offer isn't really an offer, but they shoot Friedish, and Sedain orders him to do it, and they will save Friedish. But the wounds are too bad. So, Kaur preserves the head and will clone copies of his mate forever after. But the other part is that the mind of the host is basically taken over and they become the other person. But that doesn't happen to Kaur. At least it doesn't seem to, like the Catan says. And based on other things, he says he is an amal he's an amalgam of different personalities. But Kaur himself is able to, one way or the other, overcome the others and be the dominant, if altered, personality basically because he's an arrogant arsehole and and this is what happens <laughs> now a number of things i want to raise resulting from this call has done this dozens of times since and incorporated others into his being which is pretty mental really he is basically eating souls one way of looking at it and adding them to him and their knowledge to him also, he does this to his tech priests under his command in return for sharing his great knowledge. They appear to have Call's personality grafted to them, or vice versa. Because uh, Felix even says, you know, why does Call want to surround himself by puppets? And the clone Friedish is like, well, you know, it's just his way. You know, <laughs> it's just what he's like. I guess they're independent, and I can, I guess Call's rationalization would be. Then he knows what they'll do if they've if he's got some kind of um, his mentality is being grafted onto them. So they kind of they'll kind of think like him. Speaking of that, Cole does view Felix and the Primaris as his sons to a degree. He gets this paternal instinct for them, especially because they they triggered something in him. But for the Primaris in general as well, I imagine he thinks of them as his sons. I still like the idea that he's a clone of Fabius Bile. It would be so tasty just to get a, a little. A little hint of that, a little morsel, just to keep us, us thinking. Also, I see this as the moment the Imperium became the Imperium. The last surviving, I think, well, it seems to be, great scientist of the, the, the Terran school of scientific knowledge. Those who worked with the Emperor had access to all this Dark Age of technology and still possessed a sense of innovation and advancement without the religious nature of the tech priests which he and his assistant look down on as madness and say the Emperor should have just conquered Mars, not alloyed with them. This is the death of that age of light and enlightenment. The Mechanicum are the only organisation left able to rebuild the Imperium, and they do. And they don't manage it fully, like Terra is still scarred, Mars is still scarred by the heresy, even into the current age. But the, the cult Mechanicum, with its belief in machine spirits, an aversion to experimentation in favour of ritual and rigid adherence to the STCs, probably out of fear of, you know, what the heretics did and all the evils that they, they feared anyway and what they saw as, like, innovation and ambition being mixed together and all that sort of stuff. They stagnated but preserved the Imperium. 
in decrepitude. This is that moment. But Call is not just Call anymore. Sedane didn't take over Call's body as he thought he would, but he has clearly influenced him and seems to have invested him with not just his knowledge, but his outlook that, that's, that it calls inherited from this, this great scientist. So he's more, but he was always apparently more liberal than his fellow cog boys. So I'm not too sure how far that goes. Maybe it is just the knowledge he gained. I'm not sure, but it's interesting anyway. And I don't think we're going to get a full answer to that. I don't think it's possible to. Now he's calling an OP character. Is he a Mary Sue? Well, yes, but he didn't necessarily have to be. Except for one part of the book, which I think has been done on purpose as a two-fingered salute to all of us. And, you know, I don't care. I'll take it. Uh, so, Call is that grown, right? Like a lot of people on uh, on um, Mars. And that means he's cloned fully or from human donors, he's grown. It isn't made clear. But most of the Martian population are backgrown. They are... They are given knowledge. It's inserted into their baby brains in their test tubes. Now imagine, imagine the Matrix, but the machines are actually people and and not filthy thinking machine programs. So they're taught like machine Kant, um, Neuferic, uh, Neuspheric Kant and stuff like that from birth. So they're born with that knowledge. And they, they normally can't speak, but they do try to speak, even though they can't articulate themselves because they've only got a throat. You know, they haven't got all the machines they need to be able to speak neuferically. These toddlers, these young kids, come out and they try and use their throats to make the noises, but it's just... Blah, 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 blah. In, you know, they can't, they can't articulate what they're trying to say because they're not taught to speak normally. They're taught to speak machine, which makes sense. Now, Call is different. He can immediately speak and he speaks normally. He's able to rationalise that and use the thr- use the machines he's got. And he says he needs an upgrade, but he uses the throat he's got. He says it'll pass for now. But he also comes out to the shock of the overseer and says the machine god is his father and he needs to meet him. And this, you know, obviously troubles this, I guess, child inspector or whatever, as it shows a supremely gifted, intelligent individual from birth. Now, this... Now, this is saying he was chosen. This might be saying he was chosen, right? It might be saying he was created by the Emperor or the Machine God, or if, well, if you think they're separate, or by the influence of the Void Dragon, which is something that isn't mentioned by any way. And I find that a bit infuriating that Call doesn't mention the Void Dragon, even though it's a pretty big part of the lore, which seems to have been forgotten at the moment. And I'm hoping something else is done with that. Who knows? It could just simply be that by chance this child with super intelligence has just been birthed and the information that he was injected with through the growing process he's interpreted that data because he's so smart uh, and his growing mind has interpreted it this way he's just you know he's just super smart that could be an explanation but I think this is like a purposeful Mary Sue if you get me <laughs> I think this is a purposeful thing well it is clearly uh, but yeah um if they didn't have this moment in there and Cole was just like a tech priest, I think it'd be slightly more, I don't know, reasonable. But I guess this is an explanation, which I don't know, I don't know. He is OP, he is ridiculous, but there is reasoning behind it, aside from this moment, which is ambiguous, I guess, to say the least. But we'll see what happens. I still like him, I don't care. I don't care. What we can say is that he speaks to the Emperor during a flashback. Uh, kind of, in one of uh, Sedane's memories on the bridge, speaking to the memor- uh, to the Emperor, Call is actually Call and speaks with the big man himself. And this is a, a great moment and one you should read. So I'm not going to just do it word for word and spoil it completely. Uh, you know, if you've read it, you know it. So the Emperor comes across as the most human I've ever seen him. He laughs. You know, he says he likes Call, even though most people don't. <laughs> Because Call insults him, basically. It's implied that it isn't a memory, but something happening now. And perhaps the Emperor has done this and it's it's real. Uh, there, there, there's a discussion about how time works. I keep hitting my mic with my hand, so I have to keep cutting it out. I apologise. So the Emperor says that Call will betray him in the future. He won't think he is, but he will write to. And, I mean, what the hell does that mean? 
My mind immediately jumped to something about the Golden Throne, or possibly if he succeeds in shutting the warp out of the universe using Necron technology, that will somehow harm the Emperor, being a psychic being. I don't know, there's loads of possibilities. I don't know. What I do know is that Kor actually has the means to achieve the Emperor's original plan with the Webway, but instead of using or trying to co-opt the Old One's technology, who he himself says were no angels, he will instead use the Necron's tech, either to block out the warp, or more intriguingly, maybe he can figure out how to use the Ferros network, as they are, there are loads of them all over the galaxy. And that would allow humanity to travel between the stars without having to access the warp. I'm intrigued, and I want to know more as to what Call is saying and what he's going to do next. He says, like, you know, he has a way of getting the Eldar to stop meddling in humanity's business. He has a way of shutting the Great Rift and, you know, basically destroying the gods of chaos. He has a plan. So if he is OP, I don't care. I feel what Guy has done here has made him a likeable, clever character with purpose and whose decisions and origins and personality make sense. I like him and I want more of this story. This feels like it's it's going to become the main sort of arc of 40k universe, what's happening with Call uh, and Gilliman, but Call in particular, there's, more, there's something more happening there and I'm looking forward to it. Now, that's a pretty long review. I, I took a little bit longer than I normally did because I really enjoyed this book. And I thought, because I wanted to give this a really in-depth look, and I hope I've achieved that. I hope you've enjoyed it. I haven't ranted too much. I started making some notes to cover it, and it sort of turned into, like, ten pages. (laughs) I hope you enjoyed it anyway, and please give me a like if you did, and please subscribe if you're not subscribed. There's going to be more reviews. I'm going to try and do more long form like this. Now, let me know in the comments what you think, and whether I'm right, it's a battered old CD player or not. I'm really annoyed. I don't know what it is. Thanks to everyone supporting the channel. You can see your names here. We will be having daily videos from November to January going forward. I'm making a commitment right now. That's what I'm going to do. Various different things, lore, stories, reviews, and uh, interspersed with live streams, all that sort of stuff. It's coming. That's what I'm going to do. I'm selling you now. And uh, I'm aim- that's what I'm aiming to do. That's what I'm going to do. Not what I'm aiming. That's what I'm going to do. Now, I listen to the audiobook version. I caught one weird thing. In one of the chapters, it says 10,000 years ago. But I'm like, it's talking about the size, what you're on about. And it, it, they must have meant 10 years or 10 months ago or something. Because it's about the gene stealers. And I'm like, this, this is just wrong. There's an error there. But otherwise, it's a brilliant listen. I really like the guy who's doing the sound on it, uh, doing the voices. It's doing the reading. He's brilliant. And um, if you want to pick it up, there is an audible link, or an audible link in the description. And also a link to the Amazon physical, to the physical copy on Amazon. Christ, I'm losing my voice. I'm repeating myself worse than normal. If you use them, it helps me out a lot, and I'd appreciate it. But anyway, I'll be back again soon. I'm reading The Hollow Mountain by Chris Rate. So hopefully by a week after this has been released, I'll have another review of that coming up soon. I'm getting back into the reading. I've had a little break for a month or so, uh, but I'm getting back to it now. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you again next time. Thanks for watching. Get it. See you later. Cheers.